<laughs> so, well, just let me say something about myself uh, first. So I, I, uh, I joined Opus Dei when I was 19, uh, the year the wall, the year the wall came down. <clears throat> and so my, I, I'm just saying this just in the context of, I, I didn't know who Ratzinger was at that point. I didn't even know there was a CDF, <laughs> right? So, so I, basically in the next year or two, at some point, somebody gave me a document that he had written as head of the CDF on uh, Christian liberation. So this was the document where he, he critiqued uh, liberation theology. Because back in those days, the big fear was, was liberation theology. Right? Because in the 1970s, you had these priests and nuns going down to Guatemala and basically becoming arms merchants, you know, buying machine guns to give to the natives, right, to rise up in communist revolts. And, they're, and they're, they, you can read this in their memoirs. This is, many of them, unfortunately, they lost their vocations. They ended up you know, going off in really strange directions. But so there was an attempt in the 1980s to try to correct these, these extremes, right? <laughs> and Ratzinger, uh, so that was my first kind of dealing with him. And then at some point, somebody gave me the Ratzinger report, which was published by Ignatius Press. And that kind of made him, so, so throughout the 90s, I can't say that throughout the 90s I read anything that he wrote or, or anything, because, but he was kind of a lightning rod. Like he was kind of a, there was the famous time, there was the famous, he made a trip at one point to New York City in the 90s. So, so for me, a lot of my experience with him is just him as a man and as a leader, more as a leader in the church than strictly speaking as an intellectual, though obviously there's a relationship. But there was a moment of the story going around where, <clears throat> where he was giving a lecture. There's this, there's this one church in New York City that it was built so long ago that now, like half, it's a, now it's like a, like a garden apartment church. <laughs> so it's, it's like the, the entrance of the church is actually down from the street. And the, the church overlooks, or the, the sidewalks around the church kind of overlook the stained glass windows. And so there was this one point in the 90s where he was there giving a lecture in the church. And the homosexual activists were around the church, pounding on the windows, you know, trying to stop the lecture from happening. Very Old Testament in the imagery. And so, so he was a lightning rod for cult all these cultural issues. And <clears throat> then I, uh, since I, at the time, I had be, eventually become a, I had studied political philosophy, political science. And so in 2000, 2001, I was a young uh, political science philosophy professor at Notre Dame. And that's when he also wrote the, the CDF, another CDF document on guidelines for Catholics who want to be active in political life. Like, what are some principles to keep in mind? And it became clear to me at that point that he is very interested. Like, like one of the things that I think is lost on, gets lost on a lot of people, but that he's very interested throughout his whole life in trying to identify what are the principles? Like, what are the essential principles that guide us? And he really, he really means that in the sense, like, principles actually mean something. Whereas so, so often, I, at least growing up, my, my sense growing up in America was that there's a kind of mentality in America of, well, principles are just things. You just, you can take them or leave them, you know? They're like, they're like, they're like you know, they're like these cheap, you know, uh, do not cross plastic things that you can just cut and, you know, do your thing. <laughs> you know, it's just to slow you down a little bit, right? But, I, but it's really, there's even a, if I could just, uh, if I could, there's two points in the catechism. <clears throat> uh, well, just this one point in the catechism. I think it's actually, I, I think he's behind this point. And I think he actually learned this point from a German, the, the German theologian on whom he modeled himself from the 19th century. 
which I can go more into. But this, the point 234, I, I thought since we're doing, we're in the divinity school here, that we should try to put everything in the context of theology. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think a catechism is one of the documents that he helped produce. And even the way the catechism is written, I think he had a, a kind of input into, especially, especially this, this, this aspect of the catechism where each of the four parts begins with an explanation. Because, because one of his, going back to the, whole, the origin of his whole career, which Pius could probably expound on for us, is that there, the question and answer catechism, the kind of neo-scholastic approach, oftentimes there's a context that's missing. And we need to provide the context. So one of the unique things about the current catechism, and again, all catechisms are teaching documents. They all have strengths and weaknesses. So let's not, I'm not, I'm not saying the catechism is like the new Ten Commandments. Uh, but <clears throat> that he wanted there to be a, a kind of explanatory section. And John Paul II also wanted this. I mean, they were, they were birds of a feather, to use the cliche on this point that the, the explanatory section, so, that, so like in the, in the third part of the catechism, we don't go right into the Ten Commandments. There's an explanatory, what is the person? What is conscience? What is the natural law? What is the moral law, right? What is the life in Christ? As a way of, and again, I think a second big point for Pope Benedict, everything comes down to the person of Jesus Christ, right? That's the starting point. There are several times, both before Pope and as Pope, where he will say things to the effect of, you know, the, the, the chasm between Catholicism and Islam and Judaism. In other words, Judaism and Islam are much closer to each other than either of them is to Catholicism. Why? Because they are fundamentally religions of the book and of the law, whereas we are a religion that, that follows a person, Jesus Christ. Right? And that person when we're baptized, we are recreated, right? When we're baptized, there are real bonds that are now, that, that have been established between us and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Blessed Trinity as a whole. And again, his principled approach is, these are real bonds. They establish real relationships that have real consequences in, in, in all areas of life that follow after that, Right? And so, so, for example, I think this, so I, I started a reading group with some of these professors and we were reading Sheban. And, and I, we, I can say more about, at some point, I was thinking more of the next lecture than this one, but I'd like to speak about Sheban. But as a kind of, so, but this point 234 in the Catechism, the mystery of the most holy trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of the faith, the light that enlightens them, the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith. The whole history of salvation is identical with the history of the way and the means by which the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reveals himself to men and reconciles and unites with himself those who turn away from sin. And then 236, the fathers of the church distinguish between theology and economy, theologia theologia and oikonomia. Theology is the mystery of God's inmost life within the blessed Trinity, an economy to all the works by which God reveals himself and communicates his life. Through the oikonomia, the theologia is revealed to us. But conversely, the theologia illuminates the whole oikonomia. God's work, God's works reveal who he is in himself. The mystery of, of his inmost being enlightens our understanding of all his works. So it is analogously among human persons. A person who discloses himself in his actions, and the better we know a person, the better we understand his actions. So <clears throat> I think for him, and I, actually, I, I quote these because we, I was reading Sheban, and something almost, two passages like this, almost are word for word in Sheban, right, from the 1860s. And, and, I, and I just think of, well, if he was involved in the, I mean, I, I haven't, so I haven't studied this in depth, right, yet. Right, so, but I think 
of all the people working in the catechism, he of all people would have known Chibin, right? So, so the, but I think there's also something here that's very, very indicative of his thought, right? That if we can get these principles clear, and it's not a, again, sometimes people think, oh, a hierarchy of truths. Oh, that means like there's some truths on the top and the ones that are not on the top, you can like chop them off. So long as you preserve these ones on the top. I don't think he means that either, <clears throat> right? But, there, but nonetheless, obviously the mystery of the Blessed Trinity is the central mystery of the faith. It's the starting point of the faith, you know, and we're called to enter into it. So uh, just to kind of maybe, maybe not take a uh, historical step back. So in, in, uh, in 2005, right, John Paul II dies, Pope Benedict's elected, I had met him in 2000 at this little conference. We, we didn't talk about anything substantive other than we had pleasantries. You know, I told him who I was, where I was from, you know, and I, I just thought, well, I kind of at the time thought, well, you're on the CDF, you know, you don't want to, you don't need to know about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you got much bigger issues than. So then in 2005, I was, uh, I was at this, uh, I was at a, a meeting like this at the University of Chicago with uh, Cardinal George, who had just participated in the election of Benedict. <clears throat> and so we had this discussion with Cardinal George, which, which I, I think is a good, I, I wanna use that as a frame for, our, for this seminar. And Cardinal George said, well, you know, a few things, like why, why would we elect Benedict? And he said, well, you know, now on the one hand, right, the, the German Catholic Church, the German Catholics, Right, there was this phrase from the 19th century, Alemania docet, right? The, the Germans teach. Because why? The, the Germans of the 19th century, they, they helped to, they helped, uh, on the one hand, <clears throat> they produced the kind of the naturalist revival, post-Napoleonic naturalist revival. On the other hand, they produced a lot of the advisors to Pius IX, to Blessed Pius IX. They... They were, the, they were the big motors behind the neo-scholastic, well, it became the neo-Thomistic revival. They were also the ones who helped to really give birth to Catholics, the, the renewal of Catholic social doctrine, right? And, and I, again, I could, I could give classes on all that. But, <clears throat> so by the end of the 19th century, the Germans and, you know, the, the Germans had, had really helped to produce this whole, philosophy and theology, which became a kind of foundation for laying the principles of how do we deal with the post-Napoleonic world, right? Not, not just, so not just like the Enlightenment, but everything after the Enlightenment. I, mean, I think it was an incredible achievement. I mean, no matter what, obviously everything has its limitations, right? But so I think there was this prestige that the Germans had going into the First World War. So this, this, I'm just kind of giving you a sense of the conversation we had with Cardinal George. And again, a little bit of an aside here. Now, I, so obviously, now I'm a priest. In 2015, I was ordained a priest. <clears throat> and it's kind of clear to me now, that in a way that wasn't clear to me when I was an intellectual, that, but that it's also important to keep in mind when we're doing theology, right? That... You know, so much of, this is why I quoted this point also, that right, so much of the Catholic faith, what, are, what is a priest trying to do? What, or what are we trying to do as Catholics, right? We're trying to introduce other souls. We're trying to make them aware of this reality, right? that when you're baptized, your spirit is recreated as, you're a, ch as a child of God. You now have this relationship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. You're now entering into this mystery. And it's a mystery that, it doesn't, it doesn't obliterate your nature. It actually completes it, right? And how is this mystery nourished? How does it grow? Well, through the spiritual life and through the life of the sacraments. And <clears throat> right? everything flows from that. And of course, priests, theology ultimately is at the service of that. And priests are ministers whose primary function right, is to enable the faithful to participate in the sacraments and also to understand what they're doing <laughs> when they when they partake of the sacraments right uh, to understand right this life and so even theology theology ultimately it seems to me 
should be aware that it's at the service of this reality, of this pheno- this reality. It's not a phenomenon, it's a reality. Right? Sorry, Khan. <laughs> I don't, I'm, not, I'm not accusing anybody here of being a Kantian. Who's I'm just, Kantian? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just throwing that out there. No, so... <laughs> So, <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, wouldn't, now, wouldn't the, wouldn't, I thought Hegel was the one that really thought that he was giving the, 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 the full Lutheran philosophical view. Well, but anyway. One should we, never we, underestimate the capacity of philosophers to think they've discovered the true meaning of their own religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But I, wait, 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 that's a, that's a, that's an aside of an aside. We're we're into good. So so anyway, so one, so he said, well, so so when in, the, in these conversations that we were having, like why Benedict, why Ratzinger, Benedict as Pope? Well, one thing would be that. And then he said, well, you know, obviously up until the First World War, he said, you know, maybe an image of thinking about the Church right now would be the image of. Obviously, we're dealing with pro- the church since the French Revolution is trying to deal with the French Revolution, right? And that's why I want to read. That's why I'd like to read and discuss Space Salvi, because I think Space Salvi is the document of how do you deal with revolution. So, and he said, obviously, the church was developing a way of doing things, and it was it was in this especially Western Europe, right? It was in this kind of hand-to-hand combat with the intellectual, political, business elites of Western Europe for the most part. It's, it's like in the, in the case of the United States, up until the First World War, the bishops had great difficulty even getting an, a, an appointment uh, with an important politician. Like, so I did a study on that at some point. So... <clears throat> So like, so so, and of course, in many places in Western Europe, that was also the case, depending on the regime of the moment. So Colonel George says, well, if you think about it, the 20th century was a play within a play, right? We're grappling with the remnants of the Enlightenment up until the First World War. The First World War changes that, that dynamic completely. After the First World War, you get the rise of the the more kind of clear ideological political movements, fascism, communism. And then from the Second World War, or what we now call the Second World, it's funny, during the Second World War, they called that the First World War because the First World War was the Great War, right? And then the Second, then, so the First World War was, the, the Second World War at the time was the First World War. <laughs> but how we label things doesn't matter so much, right? But so, so Colonel George said, well, from the Second World War to the present, the present now would have been, or Second World War to 1989 yeah. would have been the play within the play, right? How does the church deal with these ideolo- massive ideological mo- movements, which the church of the 19th century said would happen, right? A lot of the, You know, a lot of the, even, uh, it's funny, even Ratzinger's uncle wrote a tract in the 1880s or so where he said, unless Germany deals with this, that, this, and the other problem, the only thing that will resolve the chaos that ensues will be a Fuhrer. <laughs> so, so Georg, Georg was his great uncle, wrote this tract, and, mm-hmm. which he basically kind of gestures toward, towards what eventually. But a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the writings of the of the Catholic social teaching in the late nineteenth century, they're essentially trying. A lot of the spirit is we're trying to warn you guys that unless you address these problems, something far worse is going to happen. You know, you're going to be basically like. You're going to be sowing dragon's teeth, and so it was. It, it was. A, it was in a way prophetic. I mean, I, I put that in scare quotes, right? But it was in a way prophetic, or you, you could just say, in a way, it was just understanding the consequences of actions. <clears throat> so, Cardinal George said, "Well, 1989, kind of the 
the book of communism is closed, at least as an institutional political uh, reality. And so now in the, in the end of, and now Colonel George kind of said this, but I also had a conversation. So when I got to Rome, I went to Rome in, in 2012 to study for the priesthood. And there I, I had met in 2009 uh, another priest of Opus Dei who worked in the State Department. And he worked in the State Department for 30 years in the Vatican. And so he told me that <clears throat> both, he told me this a little bit in 2009 and a little bit more in, 2000, in 2012 before Benedict uh, Uh, left the papacy that and Colonel George said this you know that Colonel George actually said this in our little seminar that the hope that, that, that John Paul II wanted to kind of shift Catholic social doctrine and he wanted to write an encyclical that he never wrote <clears throat> which would be kind of like just like he spent the 80s kind of writing have, writing all these encyclicals that were Obviously, they were meant for the whole world, but they were really focused on critiquing communism, right? That John Paul II hoped to develop some sort of a more robust critique of Western secularism, liberalism. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it never got, in the, but he never was able to do it. And if, in, in part, John Paul II was disappointed in the American, he thought the Americans would help him to do that. And they didn't do it. They They didn't prove to be the, as loyal as he thought they would be, the American Catholic intellectuals. So, so that when Benedict was elected, <clears throat> he was elected kind of to hold, the idea would be to hold things in place because he was older. So that, so Colonel George was saying the idea, he was, he'd be elected to hold things in place while the church kind of tried to find the next Pope. <clears throat> So he, he, would, he would hold in place what John Paul II was doing, right? Because this happened, I mean, when you study the history of the papacy, you realize that there's, everyone, you know, there, there are some popes where the, the church is not quite clear. Uh, okay, who do we, you know, do we want to elect like a little bit of a younger guy so he could be here for, 20, for a generation and he could be kind of like a guiding light for, the gener for a whole generation, like Blessed Pius IX, Actually, so when they elected uh, Leo the Thirteenth, they thought he would be like one of these bridge popes, who would just, because he was also older, so they thought he would just be there for like five or six years and then die. But he ended up living, you know, however thirty years old, right? Thirty years as pope, right? So he like he he defied them all. <clears throat> I wonder if it's what he drank for lunch every after lunch every day. He had this uh, he had this drink, Vin Marini. Which was laced with with cocoa. <laughs> Not oil. No, no, with cocoa, with cocoa, with the uh, with cacao, with um, with what we would now call cocaine. <laughs> 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 but obviously, at the time, it was just a little something extra that you'd put in the liqueur. It was called Vin Marini. He even he even allowed himself to appear in advertisements promoting it. Right, <laughs> Leo the Thirteenth. Leo the Thirteenth. That explains why. He's the first pope who is on camera. I think that's this that's YouTube. Right, yeah. There's the other. Yeah, you can find this. Uh, you can find pictures of him on YouTube or f film of him on YouTube. Yeah. So, so obviously, so that they kind of thought that he would be a little bit of a bridge pope, Ratzinger, and that he would hold things in line. And, 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 the, and that the church was looking for, and probably the church is still looking for, right? The Pope who will, who will uh, come up with this robust, compelling critique of secular, modern, I guess maybe a, we don't quite have the right word for it yet. Modern, secular, liberalism, whatever, whatever that might be. Modernism. Yeah, yeah, but, but, yes. but yeah, a modernism. <clears throat> It's, it's not clear that that term itself is compelling. I think we all, like when I use the term modernism with people who are like-minded, I think we all kind of know what it means. Mm -hmm. But 
a lot of people hear that term and I don't think they understand it. Right? Yes. And so it's a much broader term. Yeah. Than just... Yeah. So <clears throat> it's like we all now know what Arianism means, right? Right. And we can all take up cause against the Arians, right? But I don't think modernism quite mm. like we know that we know the errors. Like if we've read the encyclical, like we know the problems with modernism, right? But I don't think everybody else would be like, oh yeah, right. That that's just yeah. So so because I think the idea. So again, I think, the, but I think part of, like it's interesting, right? Part of the idea of Benedict becoming the Pope, according to Cardinal George, was that the cardinals thought that number one, yes, we do need to confront. Obviously, we're leaving a whole. A whole, we're leaving something out here that's important, which is the church also has to govern the whole world. But one of the things that Cardinal George said is that, well, in a way, like when John Paul II was elected pope, it's like you elect a, someone from a communist country to basically subvert that country, right? To, to deep six it. <clears throat> so that it would then lead to the implosion of communism everywhere, right? I mean, and there was a little bit of a geopolitical strategy here, right? So I think, so Colonel George said, a little bit, right? A little bit. In the 19th century, Germany taught the church. Well, now in so many places around the world, especially in mission territories and whatnot, it's, it's the intellectual problems that are coming out of Germany, right? Which are being financed by the taxes, right? That's leading to all of this, so once again, wouldn't it be nice if we had a German pope? Just as we had the communist pope who deep-sixed communism, right? wouldn't it be nice to have the German pope that could deep-six... the? <laughs> no, I, I don't think actually the... I don't think the... I don't think the... I don't think the idea was uh, Protestantism. Just to be the Protestant pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, precisely, I, the cardinals gave you the same thing. <laughs> So, and I also remember, so I, but I think Cardinal George's insight, I think it still holds, right? Mm -hmm. I think it still holds. And I, and I guess, so what I would like to, this is why what I would like to, to go into in the time we have today, but also in the next sessions, right? I really want to, I want to go, I, I want to, I'd like to read Space Salvi. I'd like to go into, well, what, how, what were the ways in which the mission of Benedict was undermined? Right, the the charge that he was given from the College of Cardinals was undermined, and, and the Regensburg Address was one of those. The uh, the Williamson affair, which take which took place around uh, the the Summum Pontificorum, right? I think there was, I think that was part of the plot. Uh, <clears throat> I would also like to study the Synodal Way, because again, this is another. He he himself like, I, so I I prepared. Like he himself, going back to the Second Vatican Council, was making comments about, well, what is, what do we really mean by synodality, right? So this is like the whole thing. It's like we're we're now in the crosshairs of the synodal path, and uh, but there is a there's like a and 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 of course he himself in his during his pontificate he gave several interventions where he speaks about different approaches to this to the to the Second Vatican Council. And he uses he, he'll also use the French Revolution, the American Revolution, he'll use the revolutionary concept as a way of trying to understand like how do you approach these the council even, mm. right? And implement it. And so so and then I'd also like to so what I'd like to do what I really like to do is I would like to look at right like a little bit more who is this man? Where does he come from in Germany? What does he grow up in? What is he trying to address in the Second Vatican Council? And then when he becomes Pope, what is he trying to address? How that gets undermined? And then le even leading up to the thing he just published, right? After his death, this posthumous. So, so I'd like to end with his posthumous, even if we have to, even if we have to like do Italian and chat GT translations, <laughs> right? But I mean, that, I think that's enough just to, because I think some of his posthumous writings, they are published already in English in other places. But this is just kind of gathering together some of these writings from his dotage, <laughs> his papal dotage, <laughs> that, that, that could be, I, I, I think, to, to keep it contemporary. And also because why? Because I think the mission that he was given as Pope, or 
the mission that would have that would that the cardinal saw would still needed to come. Right. We're still dealing with that, and I think even those who undermined his papacy, uh, and they they're aware they're aware of his papacy as being kind of a bridge holding papacy, and they're trying to prevent the next thing from happening too. Right, and I think a little bit. Even Pope Francis, right? There have been interventions where he's been saying things like, we have to remember the church is not a, it's not a NGO, right? Go, going back to this reality, right? That the church is, the, the church is a supernatural institution, mm -hmm. which is trying to maintain the spiritual life in souls. Mm -hmm. And first of all, understand what that means and then also to maintain it. And there's, there's always a danger of people who lose that vision of then using the church for other ends, right? We can, and anybody can fall into that danger, right? There's, we have the, the, his, the church history is full of court theologians, right? Beginning with Constantine, right? Who are just there in the court of Constantine waiting to, uh, waiting to, uh, right? Waiting to uh, promote the Aryan cause, using the emperor to promote the Aryan cause. So, I know, does anybody have any comments so far or questions so far? Well, I was or, just going to say, Father, maybe you could um, lead us into Joseph Ratzinger, the man in Germany. Yeah. Right, leading up to his, uh, maybe leading up to the council, right? So maybe his early years in Germany. And, um, yeah, so th uh, that's so, actually, that's what I would like to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would like to do. <clears throat> so he himself, I mean, one of the, and one of the, I think it's a kind of a unique thing about, I think this is unique about both Pope John Paul II and about Ratzinger or Pope Benedict. It's funny, uh, in the United, in, in Europe, they have no problem calling a Pope just Ratzinger. Pope, they don't mean it in any kind of, uh, at least when I was in like Italy and France, the two, those are the two countries I'm more familiar with. Um, they'll say Pope Ratzinger, they'll say Pope Wojtyla. They don't mean it in any kind of a pejorative sense. I think sometimes in the United States, when I say, if I were to say like Pope Ratzinger, some people are like, oh, are you, like that's pejorative. So if I ever slip into that, I don't mean it in a, pejor in a pejorative way, right? It's just, I'm just, I've lived in Italy and France a little bit, so maybe I just <laughs> slide into that without realizing it. Uh, so I, I think, and again, there, there may be, anyway, so obviously he comes of age during the Second World War. And I think that it's pretty clear that his, so his family, the other thing, I mean, his family was clearly a, a Bavarian family. They were not, they were not Nazis, right? They were not, they were doing everything they could to kind of remain, I think, I think you can say they were trying to remain aloof of Nazism, right? And, and even, his family even moved progressively further outside of the city in the 1930s and into the 1940s. Why? Because it's just, if you're in the country, you're in the country, right? It's just, it's, easy, it's harder for people to come around and ask you what you're doing. You can kind of keep to yourself. Right, so by the end of this, so I actually, to be honest, I don't think that the whole, I don't think that there's any, again, the, the, there's always this effort in the media to misrepresent, <laughs> right, uh, people's behaviors and actions. And so I think they, you, you could tell as soon as he got elected, actually, I can say, that, I'll say this here, that <clears throat> so the, the day that, the day that he got elected, I was... I was the director of a residence in South Bend. And it wasn't planned this way, but the, that was the time of the Da Vinci Code. Uh -huh. And so the, the newspaper had called me and said, oh, you're a professor at Notre Dame and you're the director of this residence. And could I interview about the Da Vinci Code, right? So we're, we're in this interview in my living room and the, and the journalist says, oh, my, and my editor has called me three times now 
I mean, this was during the conclave. So my, my, my editor has called me three times now. And she knows that I'm here uh, doing an interview. And she never calls during an interview. So something must be going on. That I, I, I just, since it's the third call, I got to take it. So I'm like, sure, yeah, whatever. I don't care. So uh, she leaves and comes back. And she says, oh, we have a new pope. This interview is over. <laughs> right? That you're no longer news. <laughs> so, so then she calls me back 15 minutes later. She says, well, I was just talking with my editor. And maybe we could do an interview with you about what you think about the new pope. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we, she comes back. But she brings a photographer with her. Right? <clears throat> so we're sitting in my living room. And in my living room at the house, if you could imagine like at that map, the upper left-hand corner, we had an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary a statue. We had a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary on like a little pedestal, right? So at one point, the photographer points to the Blessed Virgin Mary and says, what is that up there? And I said, oh, that, that's an image of Mary, Our Lady of Torres Ciudad. And he, he, he clicks a photo. And I, but I didn't hear him click the photo. Right? So next day, on the cover of the South Bend Tribune is, you know, whatever it is, director of the residence, Professor Lang and whatever, hails the election of German Pope. <laughs> they got me. I, I, I was, I mean, I was, I, again, I was just naive about the tricks of journalists at that point. They got me. Episcopalian, a photographer. Pardon? The photographer was Episcopalian. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, it was an Episcopalian. Yeah. Now I understand your your keen interest in misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is probably one of the things that started it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but you can you can at the beginning of any I mean just walk, throughout your life you'll see this right at the beginning of every papacy they'll put little seeds. Uh, that, that could eventually be used to miscolor. They do this with they do this with everybody. I mean, I'm not saying that just popes, but th there's always this tendency, right, to plant these seeds that if they ever need them at some point, they will develop them into, you know, stories. <clears throat> you know, stories that are f false stories, but stories nonetheless that could be used to tarnish the reputation of the person, right? Eh, and they, that's what they were clearly doing. That's what they were clearly doing, even in the local newspaper there in South Bend, you know? So... <laughs> do you think that's something that, like, do you think the Benedict papacy, or just maybe even before the papacy, do you think Joseph Ratzinger was ever able to, like, break, in the eyes of the media, sort of evade that shadow of, you know... No, I think so. I think uh, to, to be honest, if I were to if I if I were to formulate a hypothesis, if I was directing the research of a graduate student <clears throat> in the area of public relations, the hypothesis I would say, like, like you know, I, I I could be wrong, right? I'm not. It's a hypothesis. I would say my guess would be that <clears throat> that they up until when he was the CDF, at least in the in the again the American media, because that's what I'm most familiar with, but. Up until in the, in the 80s and 90s, for, the, for the, the general media, he was like the Pope's Rottweiler. Oh, I see. Yeah, he was, it was Panzer Ratzinger. It was, yes. you know, again, the, the homosexuals who were pounding on the windows. Like, for the New York Times, that was a great event, right? Yeah. And they gave him no, no uh, quarter. Then once he's elected Pope... Like they gave him a little bit of a, because you know, beginning in 1993, they started to like have moments where they would treat John Paul II well in the media. There would be like these six week, because the media always goes in six week cycles, right? <clears throat> so there would be six weeks where they would give him a reprieve. Like the six weeks after Denver, he was a good guy in 1993. And then there were other moments, like when he came to the UN, they kind of were lighter on him. And, right? But I think with Ratzinger, it was, they, there was really like no, in as much as they covered him, it was always the Pope's Rottweiler. Like he's, you know, he was, he's like, he's the tough guy. And I think they actually mischaracterized him. Right. Yeah. And, and in a way, I think when he was elected Pope, a, lot, a number of us were celebrating. Like we, 
we kind of accepted and liked that he was the Pope's Rottweiler, right? right? And we were kind of, I think part of the jubilation that some people had when he was Pope was that, okay, finally, the Rottweiler is going to, the, the church is sicking the Rottweiler on the bad people, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there was a little bit of that. The sense you get you know? looking back <clears throat> is that for, you know, eight years, it seemed like, hey, maybe things are going to be okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Maybe maybe <clears throat> maybe the tempest has has passed. Yeah. Uh, or the, at least that you know the, the the sun's starting to come up. And he, even up until up until the time he left, my sense. So I went to Rome in fall of 2012. And my sense already in the fall of 2012. So you have to understand on some level, right? The Vatican operates as a monarchical court, and what that means is that. In a monarchical court, and if anybody has studied monarchies and their courts, and they would like to correct me on this, but my basic sense of a monarchical court is that there's a huge rumor mill. There's a huge rumor mill around the king, <laughs> right? And, and, and so the, 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 the PR or the, the, the rumor mill, there, there's always whispering campaigns in the, going around Rome, right? Even the Sistine Chapel, everyone's whispering. Well, yeah, they're actually whispering. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but so my sense, my sense is that like in Rome, when I got to Rome in 2012, what, the sense I got is that like, like, cause they were asking us if you can do anything, like if, if you want, you know, we're inviting you if you want to, if you can say good things about Pope Benedict, if you can, if you can go to a journalist and if, if any journalist offers to, interview you, if you're willing to talk with the journalist, that would, they're always like, you don't have to do it, but that would be great. Why? Because already by, already by the fall of 12, the rumor will, and, but, but our mentality was, well, yeah, there are these bad moments, you know, where public relations aren't going that well, but, the, you know, we can stick it out. You know, we can, we can stick it out. We can stay, these are the moments not to flinch. These are moments to stay strong. And, you know, obviously the, there's always wins and, in the, the, the image of the boat from the Gospels, right? There's always going to be winds and storms. And if you stay in the boat and you stick strong, like eventually the storm will calm. And that was kind of our mentality. And so the day that he left the papacy, that he announced he was leaving, I was at the Vatican walking home and there was a hailstorm and lightning hit the Vatican. I mean, it was all very dramatic. I mean, and my umbrella broke. I had, it was, actually, it was very funny. My mom bought me this awesome, this supposedly awesome umbrella for Rome, which was indestructible. And so after the hailstorm, I'm going down into the subway and it, was, it wasn't closing properly. So I'm here trying to close it, right? Try to close it, try to close it. The subway comes, the subway comes, the doors open and I go like this and then well, I hit something, I triggered something so that half the umbrella shoots into the cub shoots like a like a bullet into the into the subway car and then the doors close and the subway goes off and there goes half my umbrella <laughs> i mean everything went wrong on that day it hailed right. it hailed <laughs> lightning hits the vatican and ha and i lost half of my indestructible umbrella <laughs> right? So, so the media portrayals of Ratzinger yeah. at the time. Um, but of course, do you think that Catholics now as well, sort of internally, you know, it's even conservative Catholics and we say like, well, look at, look at this sort of great, you know, golden age of, of, of theology. You know, you, you hear like you know, scholastic say this all the time. And, you know, it's, 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 it's quite odd in that um, Ratzinger at the council is not a neo like by, very far from a neo-scholastic neo thomist Yeah. So perhaps if you spoke a little about Ratzinger's role in the council. And, yeah. Well, his intellectual his formation. Intellectual formation. formation yeah, yeah, that's what, that, that's what I, yeah, I want to go. I was, yeah. that was, after I just told that silly story, I was going to go there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so... So again, I just, I want to say a few things like, so when he's coming of age, right at the end of the second world war, right? There's one, there's one little line in his biography where, uh, where he says, when I was then in the seminary, we did not, we had plenty to eat, right? We didn't suffer through the famine, the hunger year, right? So I just, there's a few things that are, 
maybe not as intellectual, but I want to I want to just get them out there, right? That so. <clears throat> This this has to do. With, it's interesting that it's interesting that this year there's a biography that just came out on Morgenthau, trying to rehabilitate Morgenthau. And Morgenthau was the one that uh, initially Roosevelt tasked. I, I think to understand Ratzinger and the Germans leading up to the Council, you do also also have to understand the Americans, right? Because of the Second World War and how we occupied Germany after the Second World War. So. <clears throat> The, Morgenthau was it was entrusted with the hunger year with with um, remodeling Germany after the Second World War, and Morgenthau was completely motivated by vengeance. He was and even even Churchill, who I think wanted to reduce Germany to rubble, thought Morgenthau was a little extreme. <laughs> and I, I say this just to say that because Morgenthau had very it's interesting right the, I think I mean this is on a little bit of an aside but I think the Green Party in Germany wants to do right now what Morgenthau wanted to do after the Second World War <laughs> because Morgenthau which yeah Morgenthau said Germany should be deindustrialized it should no longer have a financial economy it should no longer have an industrial economy and even it's even most of its agriculture it should get from outside Right? Because why? You, can, you, can, you have to make it such that these people could never pose any kind of cultural, moral, or economic, or political threat to anybody else ever again in the history of the world. I mean, that was Morgenthau. And so I think, and, and, and uh, again, <clears throat> there was the, 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 the Cardinal Frings, and I, I mentioned Cardinal Frings because eventually Ratzinger will work with Cardinal Frings. Right, so uh, um, Cardinal Frings gives he gives homilies where he basically says, "We are now in the time where you can, if you see food, you can take it. You don't have to buy it. Right? If there's food that nobody's eating, uh, American soldiers were instructed to shoot anybody that gave food to a German soldier." Who were, who were in the POW camps, right? I mean, they were being starved to death, right? So, the, and then and it's called the, the, the hunger year, right? We, uh, this is a part of the history that usually gets, it gets blocked out, right? So, so Ratzinger, he's, he's in the seminary during this time. And he's, so he's aware of what's going on around. Now, what happens is Truman, Truman, Roosevelt dies, Truman comes to power, becomes president. And Truman basically says, Morgenthau, like, yeah, this is too much. Right. So he fires Morgenthau, and then this is where Marshall steps in and says, well, let's have the Marshall Plan. Right. Right. And they can have industry, but even the Marshall Plan, right, set up, you know, we're all, we're all into censorship these days on Twitter. So Marshall set up an office in New York City run by a guy named David Mordecai Levy. And anything published in Germany had to be approved by Mordecai Levy's office. Right, <clears throat> any 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 book, but the and then the other so then but then, but then there were there was this real effort and also I again I I looked into this at some point, even our so this is also where the the CIA starts to get involved, and so they start to get in, involved basically influencing what comes out of Mordecai Levy's office, both intellectually and also not so intellectually, so so it's in the nineteen fifties that. Through Kinsey and his people, Mordecai Levy's office starts flooding Germany with pornography. Like that's that's another element of the. And this is where Frings. So Frings. Frings becomes the leader at this. So in the U.S. In, from the, the 1930s to the 1960s, we had what was called the Legion of Decency. In Germany, I have it in my notes here. Well, they, they had Germany going back to the 1890s had a, the, the German Catholics had a, uh, it, was, it was organized, basically a way of trying to promote chastity, promote the family, you know, oppose anything against chastity in society. They had a whole, it was, it was a big part of the church, of the church life in Germany. And uh, Frings was its, Frings, Cardinal Frings was its leader. And they did, they did the similar, like, so in, in the U.S. from the 30s 
to the 60s, there, Catholics would take an oath once a year. I will not, I will not go to inappropriate movies, right? And then if, if a bishop said, like, this movie's not worth watching, like, no one would go. So I mean, there, were, there, were, there were several years where, like, Hollywood almost went bankrupt. The, the major companies in Hollywood almost went bankrupt because no, the Catholics didn't go to the movies. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, so the same thing was going on in Germany. And Mordecai Levy was working with people to like, we got to, we got to, just like we got to do in the U.S., we got to break down this, this organization. And after the Second Council, the Vatican Council, they did. They did break it down. Now, the whole idea, and, and there was, so I give this as a very concrete example of, <clears throat> obviously, ever since, so, so this is all taking place within the context of the neo-scholastic revival and how then the neo-scholastic revival gets implemented in various ways in various nations. And so just to say something briefly about this, because this is, when, when Ratzinger comes into the seminary, this is the environment that he comes into. So now I need to just take a step back to the 1820s, <clears throat> okay? So obviously we all, we're all just, we all know that there was such a thing as the French Revolution. Napoleon implements the Napoleonic Code. Uh, there's a reaction in Germany and in Europe after the French Revolution, there's both a reaction. It's interesting in in the in the German provinces, right after the Napoleon right after Napoleon falls. There's in the first few years after Napoleon falls, there's a kind of enthusiasm for the British system. But that leads to that leads to also a hunger year. <laughs> the British system didn't work out so well for them, right? So then in the 1820s and 1830s, there's, a, there's both a skepticism of, of the Napoleonic system, and there's also a skepticism of the British system. And if we could just, for the sake of the conversation, say there's a skepticism of... Nat after the French Revolution, there is this question still. Just like, just like after the fall of the, of the, of the Berlin Wall, there's some people that say, well, you know, communism in Russia and Poland, that wasn't real communism, right? So we should still be communists. Yeah, it was actually right? Cambodia and China. Yeah. That's real, real yeah, 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 no. <laughs> but, but no, no, like, so, but after the French Revolution, there's also the, the naturalist school, right? There's this naturalist school, especially in Germany, these naturalist Catholics. And I'm blanking on their names right now, but I think one of them was Hermes. Right, but there are these naturalist Catholics in Germany who basically say, I mean, their basic position was Kant, Rousseau, Locke, Voltaire, like these guys were awesome. <laughs> you know, they know they were, I mean, they were, they were just awesome. I mean, Rousseau, like living according to nature. Man's nature is good. Yeah, nature is good. Nature is just fundamentally good. You don't need to reform nature. What we need to do is we need to recast the gospels. We need to recast all of Christianity, just basically assuming that Everything they said was right, right? So we'll just cast them as the naturalist. Very little has changed. And, and, and they were, well, this is, why I'm this is why I'm going into this, yeah. So they were very adept at, they were very, and also they were very adept at working with the government to get all the university positions, right? So in this environment, some of them, some of them basically said, yeah, we're all, we're all on board with this naturalism stuff, but we need to look a little bit further back in history to see, just to see if there were some naturalist type things that happened uh, before John Locke that, that might help, help us just give like a, a, a point of reference, you know, a point of comparison. I think that's, I think that's, that's romanticism, right? Sure. Right? So, and then from the romantics, you get the, some, some romantics convert to Catholicism I think a third, I think about, a th I think the intellectual historians say now about a third of the Romantic movement became Catholic. And <clears throat> among the things that they renew interest both in the fathers of the church and also they renew interest in, in uh, Thomistic mm -hmm. studies, right? And they're kind of, in, in as much as it becomes known that they're interested either in the fathers of the church or Thomistic studies, they get iced out of the university system by the naturalists. 
So many of them end up, and many of them end up, they, 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 and actually what they end up do is they end up doing stuff like what we're doing right now. <laughs> no, they did. They would do Are these. You about the ice the <laughs> no, you're already iced. You're already on ice. <laughs> so, when, as they get, no, so they would, they would have, and literally they called them study circles. They would have these circles where they would, and, and like, so one of the things that they do, and I have another little quote here from the catechism, right? They would say, we got to go back. We got to read the fathers of the church. We got to read the great medieval theologians, preeminent among, preeminent among them being Aquinas, to discover like, what are the dogmas? Like, what are the dogmas of the church? Why? Because the dogmas are like lights, yeah. right? They show us how to live. And so in these little study circles that they started, they would study the dogmas and then they would talk with each other. Like, how do we implement these things? How do we live these things? Your and, and then, but then also, uh, several things happen. Out of these study circles, they get iced from universities. When they get iced from the universities, what do they do? They go to Rome, mm -hmm. right? And many of them, many of the people that got iced from the universities, they or they, their disciples, ended up becoming the advisors of pious, blessed Pius IX and Leo the Thirteenth. <clears throat> And especially the Thomists become big in Rome because they were especially hated, I think, right? So they become big in Rome, but then they inspire, and then even, you know, it's funny, P people who have done studies of this, they say that even in Italy, even among these romantic reformers of the 19th century, there were, the Thomists were like a hard, they were called like the hard headed minority. And even Leo the Thirteenth, he was like one of these hard-headed minority guys, and nobody thought he would be made pope, right? And then he's made pope, and he basically says, "Teach Thomism everywhere, right?" <laughs> it's it's the, all the seminaries, of the, you know. And of course, part of the whole, part of the whole, just one thing, part of the whole romantic, Thomistic movement was when they looked at seminary training in the in the eighteenth century. They basically said, like in, like in France, seminary training in the 18th century was kind of like Lockean, Rousseauian scientism with a smattering of apologetics, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like just as bad as most Catholic universities in this country yeah. right now, <clears throat> right? Just whatever is the cutting edge science and philosophy of the day, we just embrace that wholeheartedly with no filter. And then, well, we can still be Catholic somehow. So... So basically, the idea of the Thomism, the idea of Thomism was, well, we should become experts in Thomas and his whole methodology before we study John Locke or Rousseau or Kant or, or, or and then as the 19th century goes on, Hegel or whatever, right? And so that we can use that as a filter for whatever, whether it's Darwin or Hegel or whatever, right? And, and then because the Thomas went out, they kind of promoted the teaching of Thomas, they, you, know, you could look back to the beginning of Romanticism and you could say, well, a lot of them were interested also in Fathers of the Church studies. And the Thomas were a little bit, I think they were a little bit like, yeah, that's interesting, but if we don't have, I mean, a little bit, it's also just a thing of time. Like, if you don't have a lot of time, yeah. just do Thomas. Because he's like, he is a kind of summary. It's like, if you don't have a lot of time, just read a short catechism and then you know the faith and you can start. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a practical... Like, how do, we, how do we get Thomism everywhere first? And then, of course, a lot of the places where Thomism got implemented, the people didn't, the people who, like in the U, American seminaries or Catholic schools, they were just being good, obedient servants. And they didn't even understand some of this historical background now that I'm giving you. They just, like, grew up and they were formed in the seminary to be Thomists. And they didn't study, like, they're a typical American. Like, they, we don't know history. We don't know culture. We just like, you know, we just do what we're told. So they did. So when a lot of them in, in this country, when they implemented Thomism, they did it, I think, in a, as good people as, you know, wanting to be obedient. And also to some, like, I remember when I, my first, the first time I read the writings of St. John Chrysostom, it was this nun from one, a college in Detroit who she learned Greek and Latin. 
And so she translated a bunch of his stuff into, into, into English. So there, there were efforts in the late 50s to start to... So I think by the time you get to the Pope, Pope Pius X, and it's interesting, Pope Pius X right, was a parish priest. And he's the one that implemented the oath against modernism and the catechism of Pius X and really tried to reform seminaries in a good, I think, in a good way overall, right? But, in all, but so <clears throat> by the time you get to Pope Pius X, clearly from Rome, the Thomists have the upper hand in, in, in like setting educational policy for the church. The, 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 like the Romantics who were more enamored with the fathers of the church, they were like clearly in second place. And by this point, by the time you get to the oath against modernism, let's say by the time you get to the First World War, clearly the church is saying like, this whole naturalist project is no good. <clears throat> and so a lot of the, the typical history that's told, the institutional history that's told, and I, I think this institutional history is, needs to be looked into a little bit more, but the typical institutional history is that, well, the, the naturalists went underground until the Second Vatican Council. And then they, 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 they burst back on the scene, right? And that, anyway, I think that that's, that's a simplistic story. But clearly by the 1950s, I think after the Second World War, so now we're going back now to after the Second World War, the, and, and Ratzinger himself says this in the Seawald biographies, and he, he says this in several homilies, right? That after the Second World War, there's this, it's like there's this renewed hope. So I think there's two things going on after the, number one, just geopolitically, after the Second World War, the Vatican decides we're going to side with the Western powers against the Eastern powers, and we're going to try to just put an end to communism. Like just diplomatically, that's the decision the Vatican made at that point. And the minority, the minority were the, what we call the East Politique people, right? That they were saying, well, no, we should still kind of be open to both sides, right? And they were always around, but, but I think overall the Vatican, be, and especially with the papacy of John Paul II, right? He was elected by the people that were interested in, once and for all, putting an end to communism. <clears throat> And then within that, also after the Second World War, there were a lot of people that said, well, on the one hand, we've established Thomism in a lot of places. It's a kind of, it's solid, it's stable, but there's clearly limitations, right? We, still, we have to engage more with 19th and early 20th century developments. We have to, we have to engage more with 19th and 20th century scientific developments. <clears throat> Leading up to, but, but actually, but then there was also kind of a hope. The hope was that, well, actually, like, you, you, the hope was like, and I don't, again, I, I think it can be debated how much of a hope was really there, but <laughs> the hope was, well, also after the Second World War, the regimes of the West are not as hostile to the church as they were before the First World War. Like, before the First World War in the United States, Wilson, I, Wilson, like Wilson and the, and the French leader after the First World War, they didn't even want to have the, the Vatican like sit at the, at the, Versailles, at the Versailles trees. Like, like they, they wanted to pretend that the Vatican doesn't exist. It was really hard for the bishops to, to even get a... And, and part of that has to do with all the experiences of the 19th century. You know, because there were popes that basically said, you can't participate in politics, right? The regime is so bad, you just can't participate in politics to Catholics. So after the Second World War, you get all these leaders, you get Adenauer, uh, Schumann, uh, de Gaulle in France, all these, even the ones in Italy, they're all like, they're willing to talk now with the church. They're willing to negotiate, they're willing to let there be Christian parties. And they're willing to negotiate with the Christian parties. So there's less hostility, right? There's less obvious hostility. There's less open hostility. So I think the, I think the, there was like, there's several things going on in the 1950s. One is that both intellectually and politically, there's a lot of people in the Vatican and in Catholic intellectual circles that are saying, well, number one, now that, we, now that we've implemented Thomism, we now need to open up more to the fathers of the church, the study of the fathers of the church. 
and non-Thomistic thinkers, right, to see what contributions they make. Number two, the whole point of developing Thomism was that so that it can it can enable a fruitful engagement with modern politics, modern science, you know, developments, and also for that to happen, we need to not silence people who are doing this. Like, <clears throat> so the problem, so, so like in the 1950s, Ratzinger kind of comes of age, I think in the camp of the romantics who were kind of with the fathers of the church and wanted to use that. And also he, I think Ratzinger was like in the, in the studies that I've done, he liked, he loved Heisenberg. The Thomas kind of liked Heisenberg too, because Heisenberg, I think, had studied Plato as a young man. And so by the time, at the end of his even scientific life, Heisenberg says something to the effect of, the only way we can understand reality is if we admit that there's such a thing as form and matter, right? And like, all oh, the Catholics were like, woo, finally, you know, science has come around. <laughs> right? So, so there was a real hope, right? I think there was a real, there was like, there was like a real hope that intellectually, politically, we could establish dialogue in all these different areas. But as always, when the underworld meets the overworld, right? No, but so this is what has, so what, so like, and, and this, you know, this is a question that I think it's a very delicate one, but so because, so Ratzinger is the advisor to Cardinal Frings. And by the time Frings gets to the, by the time Frings gets to the Second Vatican Council, he's kind of out of it. I think, you know, I, I think, and so he, in November, he's the one, so the Second, now list, Second Vatican Council, by the late 1950s, the people around, especially Cardinal Ottaviani, Cardinal Ottaviani would be the, he's the bete noir, right, of many people, but his, anyway, so he writes a schema for the Second Vatican Council, he's like, but his, but his whole approach to the Second Vatican Council was, we got to have a council because there are these serious attacks against the family. There's these serious attacks. Ottaviani was aware of Kinsey, the whole sec, the whole mo he was aware of Wilhelm Reich. Who, who are these? So they, uh, yeah, I know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, obviously, so Sigmund Freud in the 1890s. Sigmund Freud, um, <clears throat> he engages in psychoanalysis, and. <clears throat> Freud, at one point in his, in his endeavors to engage in psychoanalysis, he basically comes to the realization that women are the pillar of Western civilization. And I think, I think Freud was influenced by Nietzsche on this point, right? So Freud basically says, we need to use psychoanalysis to wean women off of Christian morality. And actually, at one point, he makes a kind of humorous aside. He says, with psychoanalysis, we're going to do what priests, we're going to do the opposite of what priests do in the confessional. But unlike priests, we'll get paid for it. <laughs> so, so, so Freud, Freud basically, and there's, there's a group of followers of Freud that will use psychoanalysis basically to try to undo Christian morality, mm. right? So, so the, the short version of, a, of it would be to you use psychoanalysis to get somebody to sin. Though they wouldn't call it that, but that, that's what I would call it. To free <clears throat> one from their oppression. Yeah, to free from the oppressive morality of civilization, right? The, oppre the oppression of, of, of more Western moral civilization, right? So, so Wilhelm Reich, he is in... He's in the Austro-German world in the in 1920s. And uh, he's, he's a Freudian. He's, he's like, he tried to be a good Freudian psychoanalyst. He's, he's got all these Catholic clients. <clears throat> and he notices this one Catholic client comes to him and he notices that as long as, if he tries to argue with her about the existence of God, she, from her catechism or Catholic training, she doesn't go along with it. But then she went to one of these um, 
because in the, in the 1920s they began performing. They were they were they didn't begin it because you, you can it goes back to the ancient world. But in the 1920s, one of the popular ways the sexual revolutionaries would work was through performance art. Right? You get people in a theater, you get them to do impure things, and then you know. So so this so so Reich understood. At, he had this one client, and as long as he argued with her about the existence of God, she would argue back. But then she went to one of these performance art things, and she sinned, basically. And then she came back, and she didn't believe in God anymore. So Reich was like, well, this is great. I, fig I figured out the formula that if you can get people to sin, he he, if you can get them to sin, then the, the image of God just disappears within them. If you can get them to break free of their oppression <clears throat> yeah. in act, then they'll yeah. throw out their chains. Exactly, exactly. But then Reich, so Reich, Reich then realized... But now, now we have advertising, theater, film, and television. And we can use that. That's going to be much more effective than psychoanalysis. I mean, psychoanalysis is one at a time. It's, it's much too slow, right? So we can use those mechanisms. So then he wrote his book. He, wrote, he actually he wrote two books. That, two, there's two books he's known for. One is The Mass Psychology of Fascism, right? And then the other one is sexual revolution. <clears throat> and the sexual revolution book comes out in the 1930s. But because of, because of, because he also wrote the mass psychology of fascism, the people that were, as soon as the book came out in English, even in the 1930s, the people who were interested in promoting that book shut it down. Because why? They said it's going to take us a generation to separate that idea from the fascists. So then they republished the book in the 1960s in English. And then they put it on the cover of Time magazine, which was the organ for like, promoting these things in the 1960s, right? Hmm. So, so Wilhelm Reich, his, his book was like, this, it's like the, um, <clears throat> I, could, I could give you references if you want to read more. I mean, I have all sorts of, I've, I've looked into this, right? So Reich's book was kind of like the, like, like essential reading for sexual revolutionaries in the, in, the, in the 50s even, but it was more underground, right? And <clears throat> then Kinsey was this, Kinsey was this, uh, he's, the, he's, the, he's a follower of Wilhelm Reich in the United States. He spent time at some of these institutes in Germany that were dedicated to this uh, agenda and then comes to the US and he becomes like, the so-called so big scientific researcher in this area, this big promoter of, of basically, what, what's, basically of what's, what's deviant is normal. And that would be the simplest way to, to put it, right? And he becomes like the darling of the American intellectual class in the 1950s. <clears throat> and even in Germany, even in Germany in the 1950s, he at some point gets... He's brought to Germany, and he, they they take they bring him on a tour, and but and this is where like this is where the problems start because is he a scientist, or is he an ideologue, yeah. and of course in the fifties and sixties and up until nineteen seventy two, Kinsey is presented as a scientist, so if we're in a new age, right, and even Ratzinger at some point, where he's discussing Heisenberg. You know, he says, Heisenberg is the science and the Second Vatican Council, we wanted to be open to dialogue with science. And then in the, in the very next paragraph, he discusses uh, the family and sexual morality and whatnot. Because, like, and, and even, even to this day, I mean, this is, the, this is the issue, right? Are these things scientific? Are they scientific and naturalist? Or is something else going on, right? And it's always... So when you get to the Second Vatican, so, so he is, so, so the other thing is, right, in the 1950s and 1960s, if Frings or if any, if the, if the, now also the, the, culturally in the 50s in Hollywood and also in, in Hollywood and also in the German film industry, the producers are actively trying to make films so as to break the cultural influence of Catholic organizations. So they, they, they keep trying to make films that, 
So for example, what they do in the United States is they, they, they film the palm broker, where they, they film, a, they film a, a scene with a black lady who commits impurities with a Holocaust survivor, right? So how could you ban that film, mm. right? You're anti-Semitic if you ban that film, right? Right, and so that's how that's the movie that they use in this country to once and for all break that code or break the, the break the, break yeah break the Hollywood production code. In the in Germany, they used uh, an Ingrid Bergman film, The Silence. But there were several attempts in the '50s and into the '60s to try to break the German production code, and eventually, so the the whole. What happens is that in 1964, again, I, ha I can reference all this stuff. I mean, I, I have more references which I could give you. I just, I'm just kind of off the top of my head a little bit here. But so in 1964, Frings, so, so Ottaviani, going into the Second Vatican Council, he writes all of these schemas for the Second Vatican Council in which he says, he'll say things in the schemas like, our universities, are, they're coming under attack. We need to recommit to Thomism and using it as the lens or as the filter for dealing with, dealing with these problems. And actually, I don't, I don't know if Ottaviani even knew this or not, but like at Notre, even at Notre Dame at that time, it was really interesting that, because I, I, know, I know someone who wrote, uh, he did a study of Notre Dame's philosophy, the history of its philosophy department. A French guy, Florian Michel, wrote a great book, The History of Thomism in the 20th Century in North America. And it's like, it's like one of these books is like this. He, he did a lot of research. It was free. But so even at that time, there was a challenge made against Notre Dame's philosophy department. And the president of the university said, look, this is an ideal department. Every, almost every person in the department knows St. Thomas, also is very familiar and is an expert in the field of some modern or contemporary philosopher Right? And also, there's several in our department who are not Thomas, but who are very familiar with some other mode of Catholic philosophy. And even those who are Thomas, there's at least three different schools of Thomas. <laughs> right? So the Notre Dame philosophy department in the late 1950s had a kind of genuine like, Catholic pluralism. It wasn't, it wasn't like this monoculture. <clears throat> that oftentimes is the way they characterize Ottaviani or people who are sympathetic with Ottaviani. Even conservative new scholastics characterize this age as being this monolithic. Yeah, 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 inappropriately. They're, they're yeah, common, right, monolithic. right. It, was, it wasn't as monolithic as you think. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <clears throat> so, and then Ottaviani also said, well, my, anal my understanding of the film industry is that there are these huge, based on Kinsey, because Ottaviani was familiar with Kinsey and Wilhelm Reich, right? He said, based on all this, the film industry, I don't see how we can transform it. I don't see how we can change it. So we're going to have to set up our own production houses, our own means of finance, our own, in, our own distribution. We're going to have to set up the whole network so that we can't be attacked by finance and, and deep six by finance. And <clears throat> so basically, right, the Second Vatican Council starts... And for a while, there are these debates following the Ottaviani schema. And then Frings actually, in November of 64, is the Frings intervention, right? And the Frings intervention is, it's basically, I mean, I, I, could, I, could, I could find the quote, I don't have it right here, but basically, and, and I think Ratzinger, I think Ratzinger gives enough, enough hints in his autobiographical statements he he wrote he wrote Frings' speech. He was the he was the ghostwriter for Frings' speech at the council. At the council, yeah, yeah. And basically, it's like <clears throat> I I agree with all the objectives here, but we have to take a little bit of a different approach. We have to basically take a little bit of a wider. We have to allow for, you know, in the fifties we were doing we were coming down too hard on some people who were trying to make an alternative approach. Mm -hmm. At this point in the council, the American, I, I, I think the American naturalists and the German naturalists, they, 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 it was an American that led the applause that, that basically shut down Ottaviani and humiliated Ottaviani and basically shut down completely and led to kind of scrapping all of the, the whole schema 
and then rewriting everything, right? And so at this point, <clears throat> and I think this is a point of ambiguity throughout the, you can see during, we're gonna read some documents, I think that, you can see that throughout his whole life after this point, there's a kind of, because by the late 60s, and he'll say this at some point, by the late, he thought, when he went along with the Germans, I'm just saying right now, it's, it's not just the Germans, right? But it's, it's the locus of it. It's like the Germans were the intellectual, were the intellectual leaders of this, and the Americans were the henchmen, right? <laughs> right? Because the Americans were not really intellectual. They were just, I don't think they understood fully what they were doing, right? But, <laughs> no, I really don't. I think they were just, they were just like, they were like the, they were the muscle, right? It was American muscle and German, <laughs> But so the German naturalists who were like hiding in the underground and the Americans who were like the henchmen, at this point, they join, they're all clapping with Frings' speech. I, th I don't think Frings was fully, because what you see, if you study the doc, if you study how the documents of the council were then shaped after the intervention, it's like, so I, I've done a study of Dignitatis Humanae, of Nostra Aetate, uh, of Lumen Gentium, Gaudium et Spes, right? In all of those documents, there's real danger in all of them of, of, uh, of the church overteaching its traditional teachings. <clears throat> and then uh, in, almost, in, in many cases, at the last minute, a, a paratus will step in. One that frequently steps in is Ratzinger. Another one that frequently steps in is Wojtyla. And they save the day. As far as, they don't remove all the ambiguities, but they at least make sure there's no errors. And they make sure that the, that the traditional teachings are all preserved. The dogmas are all preserved. <clears throat> but, and even Ratzinger then will say, at the, at, by the end of the 1960s, he realized, he'll say things like, I thought in the 1950s, when I was in the university doing theology, right, I thought that everyone around me, like, we were just trying to, while being respectful of neo-scholasticism, we were trying to kind of like break out of it. And we had this great confidence that if we were to make a mistake, that the bishop or the rector or the, the rector or the bishop or the pope would, you know, would, it would, would let us know. Right? If we went too far, right? if, we, if we were to make an error. Like, so we had this great confidence that we were doing theology, you know, trying to basically understand what was going on around us, also understand the limits of, I mean, in other words, also understand the limits of what was going on around us, so as to come up with a, a new creative approach with the confidence that authority would actually, was exercised as authority. And we, but he said, by the late 60s, I realized, right, that all these people that I thought I was doing this creative theology with, they were interested in something completely different, <laughs> right? <clears throat> that they weren't, they, were, they did not, they did not understand the limits. That's funny out the hard way. <clears throat> right? The other thing is that, there's this other thing is that, the other thing is that there was a real, I think, and I, I think among, I think there was also like going back to the Legion of Decency and whatnot, and also, especially among the Americans, right? There was this real, there was kind of this, like, what do we do about cultural things? And there, be, there was like a, there was like a, a, a spirit that went through, like, we can no longer be protesters, right? No more protesting. No more, no more like voting with your feet. No more objecting. No more, no more legion of decency type stuff, right? No more. So by, by the time you get to the late 1960s, in, in every country, that, that's all swept away. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and there was just like, a, and even to this day, this remains. Like, there's going to be, gonna be mm -hmm. no effort to, like, mm -hmm. even though, even though, like, all sorts of people in the last two years, for example, like, Netflix gets so bad, they're like, I'm canceling my subscription, right? But there's, but even with that kind of stuff happening, you, it's going to be, it'd be it's, it's very hard right now to see how the, the church would say people should do this. Right. Yeah. Right. No, it's almost. There's like a spirit against protest, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm like, 
That's the foundation of our country is protest, man. Come on. That's what do you think we did with the British? <laughs> yeah. Would you say that, because the phrase intervention actually seems like a very interesting sort of moment where uh, Ratzinger, of course, who's the one behind the, the, the intervention, um, seems to say, let's break from sort of neo-scholastic thought. And yet because... The Not break from. Or like break, break past. As it yeah, or I would say, advance. I would say, you know, a lot of times these things are matters of emphasis, right? Right. So, so it would be like we have to we have to give room for other approaches, right? And and when he says that, all the sort of liberals <clears throat> in the room are applauding it because they think that this is a good sort of way of yeah. getting the sort of all, all of the even good bits of neo-scholasticism out of the you know the. Right. Parts of it out. right, right. Whereas Frings obviously doesn't mean let's let's make a liberal church. It right, means like right, right. Let's, let's break free from the sort of maybe the methodologies of new scholastic thought, maybe sort of, you know, um, undermine the road to hell is paved with parts. good intentions. But, right? No, 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 no. no. But, but break, I, break free is an interesting thing. <laughs> 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 the point I'm trying to make is that um, when Ratzinger then goes on after the council, so the Concilium Journal is yeah. formed. He's one of the founders of it, right. and then with the sort of new new theology, you know, as opposed to in many ways the you know the, the new, new scholastics found their own, you know, the new Black Friars or whatever yeah. journals uh, that are out there. When Ratzinger leaves Concilium, what do you think that signifies within the context of you know you know the founding of Communio with? Uh, with von Balthasar and de Lubac and... I, is the question you're asking, Pius, sort of what effect the council has on Ratzinger himself? Yeah, and, and also the sort of middle way that he tries to make between, you know, the excesses of Neo-Thomism on the one hand and then the people... The naturalists on the other, yeah. The Chilean journal on the other, naturalists on yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, yeah, the, actually, the, so I think, so also just, just taking a step back here, right? So in, in, uh, in Time magazine... I think it's 1963. Michael Novak was a stringer for Time Magazine. He was a writer for Time Magazine. And he coined the term, the spirit of Vatican II, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? So you can, and Time Magazine then really was part of the propaganda organ of promoting the spirit of Vatican II mm -hmm. at this point. Kind of. Surfing now. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because they, because they don't know anything, man. Just... <laughs> no, they know a lot of people do. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so sixty-three, the Time magazine. Was... I think the Time. I think we could. I mean, I, again, we could That's go back. Really and... Interesting tidbit. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I. I mean, I could get to the. I could find the footnote. I could dig it up if I had to. But, but so. But the whole point of time, the whole point of spirit of Vatican II was precisely to say the documents don't mean anything. Mm. Right. The, the documents don't mean anything. Mm. It's it, what, what means, what, 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 what we're really, we're the new zeitgeist. Mm. We are the zeitgeist, right? And that's what has to guide us now. In, so in, for a time, it seemed like that is sort of what happened, right? It, it so, was true for a bit. yeah, I would say in the seventies and the eighties, that that so so basically, but going back to Pius's question, I think by the, uh, I think in I think in either in, in one of his writings or in one of his interviews, Ratzinger points to the moment that he realized something was off. And he basically says, yeah, we need to, <clears throat> you can almost say like he realized our real friends are the neo-scholastics, mm -hmm. not the naturalists, mm -hmm. not, not the naturalist sexual revolutionaries, yeah. right? And I think, I, think, I think he was, you know, sometimes, I think sometimes in intellect, I think maybe this could be, this can happen in intellectual environments where since you're, you're always talking ideas, and you very rarely will see how ideas have effects, maybe secondary and even tertiary types of effects. You can oftentimes be in intellectual circles. I'm not saying us here, but, <clears throat> but you can be, I mean, I know this from being within, uh, like uh, for me, a great moment in life was, uh, I was at this conference in, in 2008 when this, and the conference was taking place the week 
of 2008 when the stock market was crashing. Mm. And it was, it was like being, I, I, th I felt I was in an, in an Edgar Allan Poe <laughs> short story because as every, we're in these appetizer, we're in this appetizer and there are all these TVs are like uh, around the appetizer and they're all showing these screens of the stock market kind of going like, down like this. Yeah. And it's like everybody's whipping off their mask. It's like, now we can be open Marxists again. Like now we've been hiding. We've been in hiding since 1989. <laughs> this, is our, this is our great opportunity. That's what happened. And then yeah. that came the cultural Marxism. Exactly, too. yeah. Then, well, but, that, but even the cultural Marxism, the, the, I sad to say that the, the, the groundwork for cultural Marxism was being laid going back to the 1980s right. no, sorry, sorry. at Notre Dame. With uh, Pete Buttigieg's father, Joe Buttigieg was the the guy promoting. That's how you say it. That's how I say it. Well, that's not how I. Among friends, I say it even different, even differently than that. But, but. But no, in the night in the eighties. Uh, all this money started coming to Notre Dame through Joe Buttigieg, the mm -hmm. father of our, uh, what does he do, transportation secretary? <laughs> and uh, basically to promote the translation and the popularization of Gramsci and Foucault mm -hmm. in America academe. I think, Father, in the interest of time, that's a good place to grim note, but... Um, but, but just let me say one more thing. Uh, so, so it's after, it's it's during that moment where he basically realizes, and I think this is part of Comunio, and and the other efforts then that were made in the seventies, right? That now we have to we have to be more in league with with the Thomists mm -hmm. because they're the one. Like Carol Voitia, I think so. So the friendship between Voitia and Benedict is. Uh, very symbolic of that. 